and welcome back everyone and if you're new to my series welcome it is september 4th labor day weekend 2016 here i apologize for my raspy voice i'm going on about uh three maybe four at the most hours of sleep for the last four days um been attending the shelby ham fest in shelby north carolina each day and uh the lack of sleep is catching up with me but let's dive on in and uh, get to question number one here um, question one, uh, service work and timing is what I titled it. And you had someone here respond to my, my audio research SP3 restoration part one, which by the way, part two is coming soon. Um, and they said, Hey, Mark, can't wait for more. How long would, you know, how long, how is it looking for you to do work on my Marantz 4270? And please let me know how long the wait would be. Well, this is a question I've uh, kind of been waiting to answer online here. I've given some hints to it, but uh, here is the reality. Um, I have recently accepted a new position with a new company in Charlotte, North Carolina. So uh, a couple things are changing for me. Um, one, my commute is going to be much longer. And two, I just feel like for the first uh, while in a new career, new new role, you really need to focus your attention on it. I've got a uh, I've got a pretty good uh, size team that'll be reporting to me, and there's a lot of projects going on, so um, got to kind of get that under control and uh, get acclimated to the new uh, culture, etc. So I'm going to devote most of my time here over the next while to my career. Once that kind of levels out, then hopefully we can get back to doing some things. But I don't know if that'll be a year out or uh, or longer. We'll we will see, but. I've made postings on my website, basically says, hey, I'm not taking any new customer gear in. Uh, for those customers that had not yet shipped any gear to me, but they were in my queue, I basically sent them a note saying, hey, sadly, I'm not going to be able to take your work in. Um, and then for those that had already sent in gear to me or I had picked up somewhere, I've been completing those little bit by little bit and I'm uh, going to flush out the queue there. So I'm still willing to... Uh, to give advice, still going to do these YouTube videos, uh, no doubt about that. I really enjoy doing these, um, but the time I have to focus on customer stuff is uh, coming to an end for now. It really boils down to, um, you know, when you've got a piece, a customer's piece of gear, they're waiting on it, so they're waiting on you to do something. And um, I'm just in a mode right now where the time I get, I would rather focus it on my own stuff, like these YouTube videos. You know, if I make one and it takes a day, great. If I make one, it takes a month, great. If it takes a uh, you know a week, great. Uh, but you know, it's kind of on my own time. Similarly, um, I've got plenty of my own gear to make YouTube videos with, um, lots and lots of gear stashed away. So no worries about having content available. But there again, I can do that on my timetable versus uh, someone else waiting on me. Hope you understand, and uh, we'll keep you posted as things go on. Okay, up next here, uh, question number two. Hey, Mark, could you do a quick drawing of the bench switch? Something is um, is missing with what you have on your site. I'm trying to build it. Your site is great. I'm learning a lot. Keep up the good work. And I went back and watched the video. <laughs> Um, apparently I did some ugly cropping or, or the video did something um, when I put it on YouTube and it kind of squished up my, my graphics. So here is the full-blown picture. And if you go to my website, www.blueglow.net, um, under diagrams, I've created a new little section there. I think I called diagrams and info or something like that. It, um, it will actually uh, show you this picture. But you can kind of get a feel here for... Um, you know, this is the uh, switch itself right here. It was an old um, uh, video switch that I picked up at a ham fest, and I, it just happened to have about 10 BNC connections on the front of it. And I thought, wow, that's a great looking uh, device. And I gutted it. I stripped all the electronics out of the inside of it, and I just used the chassis itself. But um, as you can see, um, you know, the way this kind of works over here, you got your stereo, the left channel, right channel, they kind of come into a terminal block. And this, this little dotted line all the way around right here, this is kind of what's inside of the uh, chassis that this uh, um, the BNC connectors are on. So there's a terminal block inside here, and then on the other side of this terminal block, and, and basically I, this is just where the uh, speaker wires go to, coming out the other side of it, you've kind of got the uh, single post, single throw switch, which um, lets you choose between left or right channel here, and ultimately that sends all that same signal to all 10 of these. 
One has a little divider network here. It's just a 1 to 10 divider network. I think I used a 10K resistor and a 100K resistor here to do a little divider network on the center pole of that one. And I feed that one out to the oscilloscope. Um, you know, I also feed out of this into the HP3582 spectrum analyzer. I feed out of this into the uh, 8903B um, audio analyzer. And, uh, you know, you also feed out of the other side of that to the phono jack, which is driving the stereo that then ultimately drives the speakers. Um, and then I've got a switch here uh, off of each of these that's dual post, dual throw, that chooses between the speakers um, that I have up on the bench here or an 8 ohm dummy load. And these are 250-watt, 1% Dell resistors that are mounted inside of this chassis, basically. Um, that's the short and narrow of it. Um, if you've got more questions about it, I can try to send you some pictures of the inside of it or give you more details. But it's a pretty simple setup, uh, not a ton going on there. Okay, up next we had a question here. Just wanted to say thanks for the fantastic videos on YouTube. I'm a lifetime learner like yourself, built some, built some guitar amps, getting into hi-fi, etc. Um, love to see a video where you discuss some of the different capacitors on the market at different price points, which ones you like for hi-fi, which ones you don't, and why. Maybe address which points in the signal merit spending a little more, etc. Okay, I'm about to... Um, <laughs> approach the second, if not the first, most controversial topic in hi-fi these days, and that is uh, capacitor types. Uh, the other competing for first place would be tube types. So uh, let's dive on in and uh, talk about this one a little bit. Okay, just like I said, this is going to draw some debate. So I'm just telling you what I do and what I like. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. It's it's a classic age-old Chevy versus Ford debate, uh, Mercedes versus BMW, whatever. Um, everybody's entitled to their opinion, so this is my opinion. I think the best value for the dollar in the uh, hi-fi field right now, they're not dirt cheap, but they're very affordable, are the orange drops, um, either the uh, you know the 914Ps, the 915Ps, or tubes and more, um, otherwise known as antique electronic supply. They've kind of got a house brand of orange drops that are an incredible price point, and I've had great success with those. So check them out. Um, I think they're they're great. Um, up next would be all the versions here of the um, Russian paper and oil capacitors. I think they're uh, they're just great capacitors for the money. Um, you know, these things, th these orange drops are anywhere from a dollar to three dollars a piece. These you'll start to get into maybe two to five dollars a piece on the uh, paper and oil. Some, some of them, depending on the values, could get on up towards ten dollars a piece. But, but either way, I mean, you rebuild an amp, you know, if you put thirty or forty dollars in capacitors in it, you've probably not broken the bank. And I also like the Solene brand. Um, you know, for the money, these things get into the anywhere from three to about eight dollars a piece um you know there again you're doing a doing a unit uh you're not going to break the bank uh going down this path okay up next if you want to go the cheaper route um you want to get down into the maybe 50 cent to a dollar um capacitor maybe two dollars on the high end um kind of range then you're going to go with the yellow propylene caps uh, otherwise known as poly caps typically or these kind of more brownish um, um, colored ones, typically made by Panasonic or some some variation thereof. But these things, they sound really good. I mean, there's there's nothing exotic about them. You're probably not gonna you know find an amp with these in them and say that's the best amp I've ever heard. But you would say, wow, that's a pretty good sounding amp. And um, as a matter of fact, these 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 um, Panasonic caps like this, they sound really good. So you know. If you're on a budget, trying to do something fairly cheap, trying not to sink a ton into something, or if you just want to restore something to see how it sounds before you go and sink a bunch of money into it, this may be a good way to go. Um, I actually restore quite a bit of, of stuff using these types of caps, especially if the customer doesn't want to put a lot into it, or if it's just something I'm playing around with, um, nothing I'm planning to keep the rest of my life. Um, this can absolutely be a great path. And last on the set of caps that I like to use, you know, if you want to get up into the maybe $8 a cap to maybe $15 a cap range, maybe this is something you're wanting to keep long term and uh, whatnot. I think the Aria caps are really good caps. There's a couple different versions of these, but I think they make some really good um, 
um, really clean sounding capacitors and I also think Alden makes some pretty good capacitors um, you get these from Parts Express fairly inexpensively it's a company that mostly makes caps for uh, crossovers and whatnot speakers but they also make some you know some really great uh, you know same caps can be used in high-end gear and um, so check those out not a bad deal on some of these some of these when I've used them like these Alden cap pluses here they'll get up in the maybe ten dollar range or whatnot but um I've seen some uh, some popular guitar, uh, I mean, uh, popular amplifier manufacturers using these. I started trying them in a couple things, and I've I've enjoyed them myself. So uh, it's a good path to go. I'm not going to show you any more caps because anything beyond this is just my personal opinion. You're you're starting to spend a lot of money for maybe marginal, if 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 not negligible gain. In other words, the point of diminishing return kicks in. You know, I've seen everything from V-caps, which those things can get up into $100 a capacitor, um, black gates, et cetera, et cetera. These things just get crazy money-wise. And I'm not saying they they don't sound better or maybe they they aren't uh, extremely pure, purely made or whatnot. I'm just saying the point of, you know, being able to notice it with your ears <laughs> and um, versus, you know, the money you spend is, is sometimes questionable. It's almost like the placebo effect. You spend a hundred dollars on capacitors, and your amp sounds amazing to you, but um, you know then you find out, oh gosh, they haven't put them in the amp yet, and you're like, oh. So <laughs> it's just one of those things. Uh, this is about the top end I would go right here personally. Okay, next quest part of the guy's question was, hey, which ones are worth replacing in an amplifier? Um, what should I look for? Well, first off, you want to follow the signal path, and that's where you want to stick these. Uh, uh, better quality coupling caps. So signal comes into the RCA jack here, flows in here uh, through the grid resistor into this um, into the grid of this one half of the 6SL7. It then gets um, amplified, comes out the plate side of that, and goes over here into the second stage where it feeds over and into the grid of this half of the 6SL7. Well, why do you need a coupling cap? Why couldn't you just run a straight wire right there? Then you wouldn't have anything affecting the tone in that signal. Um, because that's what capacitors start to do. They start to shape, just in the slightest way, the, uh, the um, characteristics of the signal flowing through the amplifier. Because remember, it's a uh, reactive component, right? It's not a pure wire. Uh, it's not a resistive component, it's a reactive, when inductors and capacitors, and so they start to, in some way, shape, or form, shape the uh, signal flowing through. So you're trying to minimize that by using good quality capacitors, right? Um, but you've also got to have this thing here to separate this stage from this stage, because there's about 300, probably 20, 40, maybe even 60, 360 volts sitting on the plate right here of this 6V6. Well, if you had a straight wire, then you're basically that voltage would flow over here, over a little resistor, maybe get dropped a little bit, and go into the grid of this half of the 6SL7, basically uh, lighting it up <laughs> like a firecracker, uh, probably glow red really quick, and burn the grid up, and this tube would be useless at that point in time. So you've got to be able to separate that, um, and block the DC, that's what capacitor coupling capacitors do, so the DC does not flow through here. So theoretically right here you could have zero potential you know, volts of DC. Something else in the circuit may be feeding it some voltage right there, but not coming from this side of the circuit. But they allow AC to flow through them. But you want your AC to flow through and not get shaped by the capacitor. So use good quality coupling capacitors. Signal flows into here. It then comes through the grid makes it out the plate here starts headed down this way, right? However, this is a push-pull amplifier and you need both halves of the signal, both the positive half and the negative half of the signal. So this signal actually um, flows on the other side of this coupling capacitor back down through, makes it, I'm sorry, right here, makes it back over, comes back in, and then gets into this half of another SX6SL7. Same thing, the other half of the signal gets amplified, sent back up, and then gets shot down through here. So in other words, you're sending kind of from here you're splitting the signal in half part here part here and you're starting to send it into here and you're starting to send it down through here so you've got to have coupling caps put them in here put good ones in here it feeds then into the grid here of this tube then uh, the, it gets amplified the signal comes out the plate goes through the 
output transformer, gets inducted over to the other side of the transformer, feeds the speaker wires, and moves the coil in your speaker. That's how this amplifier works. So, one, two, three places here you would put decent quality coupling caps. If you'll notice, there's some other places here. This one you might want to put an, an OK cap, but you don't have to do anything special here. This is the feedback circuit. It's grabbing a little bit of the signal from the output, sending it back across and feeding it back into the input here on the cathodes of both of these tubes. So you could use something maybe like one of those yellow poly caps here or one of the brown Panasonic poly caps right here. Um, wouldn't have to go high end. I would go a little bit higher end right here and here and here. You know, there's other capacitors here. This, these are the uh, cathode bypass caps here. There's another one right here feeding off the cathode, res you know, parallel with the cathode resistor right here. Um, you don't have, these are electrolytics, so you wouldn't use uh, coupling caps in those cases. And there may be a few other places in an amplifier, like in the power supply, where you would see a, um, you know, a non-electrolytic type capacitor. Uh, for noise or whatnot, you can typically get by with using something uh, on the lower end, like the yellow poly caps or the uh, the brown poly caps, and don't have to go high in there. Hope that makes sense and helps you out. If you got more questions about this, I can walk you through it. But that was a, a high level walkthrough of where you might would want to use uh, a little bit higher quality coupling caps. Okay, a simple question here, but a little bit tough answer. This is one of the questions I get the most. It's got to be in my top three number of questions I get. And here's two of them I got in about one week. Really enjoy your videos. I have a favorite ask. Plan doing what you do to a Marantz 2270 phone on board. Do you have the parts list and can you name where you purchased them from? I had a hard time finding the right parts. I was looking on Mauser, but they have so many it's confusing. Up next, my name is Roberto, located so-and-so. have a Kenwood KA5002. Um, could you sell me a cap kit for that? So, uh, sadly, um, I don't sell cap kits, and I don't make a parts list. Um, it's not what you want to hear I put here. Um, but I don't maintain a parts list. What I do um, is I open a unit, I pull out a part, I look in my box of um, spare parts and I put one back in that matches it. I kind of do a like for like swap out and I can do that because I built up a pretty extensive inventory of parts over time and anytime I um, you know run into something I don't have I don't just order one I'll order 10 or 12 so the next time I need one of those I've got it. Um, so I've never built a parts list and I probably won't unless I find some time in my retirement. I will agree with you that Mauser and such are complicated. Just take your time. Here, here's the hint I would give you. Jump on the forums. Um, both of these questions that people sent me right here, if they had posted these things somewhere like one of these sites here, uh, DIY Audio, Audio Karma, DIY Tube, those are the three I hang out on the most. Um, somebody would have answered your question on there I'll guarantee you because you don't just have one well, when you send an email to somebody you have one person looking at your at your question when you make a post you may have a hundred people look at your question and four or five of those may have some answers and some opinions you may have to shift through a couple opinions to get to get the right answer but um hey and I may even respond on there but the good thing about that then is other people can see your question and other people can um can get value from the answers that people post. I would also tell you search these sites um, for um, what you're looking for. The answer may very well already be there. I use these sites every single day. If I'm rebuilding a phono board or something in a unit I've never worked on before, there's no way I'm flying into that blind. I'm going to these sites, I'm Googling, I'm searching, um, you know, I'm looking to see what experiences other people have ran into. Because, um, you know, every once in a while you'll find something where somebody say, hey, the circuit board was marked wrong in this case. Instead of the positive being on the top and the negative on the bottom, it's actually the other way around. But they printed the circuit board um, in error. So be careful when you're replacing that thing. Well, I would probably not have caught that. Um, but so, so take your time. Use some of these great sources and... Um, kind of go from there uh, you know the thought around um, kind of building up a parts list and or um, you know I can promise you if I go to the extent of building a parts list I'm going to drop some items in a bag seal it up put it on eBay and offer it for sale but that's not happening anytime in the next 10 years maybe maybe when I hit retirement I just don't have the time um, um, to do those types of things these days I uh, wish I did Next question, someone's basically saying, hey, I know the Tektronik 576 
uh, is a curved tracer made for tubes. By the way, those things are extremely rare these days. They're like anywhere from three to five thousand um, dollars. But I also know the Tektronix 577, which is made for transistors, looks just like it. Could it be used for tubes? Um, and um, I will tell you that I have seen that done before. There is some used to be someone that made kind of an adapter uh, kit, maybe provided the high voltage, whatnot. I'm not sure but that allowed that to happen. Um, I actually know a guy that may have one, so I will ask him about it next time I see him, but I'm not sure when that'll be. By the way, I love your little Sleestack um, avatar here. But what I would tell you is, um, if you're interested in a tube curve tracer, go check out the guys at um, uh, Micro Tracer. Uh, a huge website with a huge following, got its own little forum group going um, out there, lots of user submitted stuff, but it's basically a little board here, and then you had to build your own box with your own tube sockets and whatnot to, uh, to allow for the tracer to work, but um, it's kind of a DIY kit. They're about $240, I think, shipped to the United States, uh, so not doesn't break the bank. You might spend another hundred or two building a nice box with uh, tube sockets and whatnot but check it out I have been wanting to do one for a long time I just have not had the time but when I do I'm gonna jump on one myself all right next question here someone sent me a uh, a thing basically they sent me a schematic for an ICO sine wave generator and they're basically saying hey could you tell me what parts to put in this thing well um, I wish I had the time to sit down and just answer everyone's emails like this and uh, you know I could spend an hour doing that you know just telling you exactly what I would order you know part of uh, you know working on something uh, isn't actually sitting down with your hands in the unit with a soldering iron and whatnot most of the time I spend when I'm working on something is um, over on my PC searching for what other people have done things to watch out for um, searching for part values, schematics, um, service manuals, etc. So you know that's typically billable time, and um, you know I could easily sink an hour into this. What I what I will tell you here is just kind of kind of do it like um, like for like. Anywhere there is an electrolytic, read the value on it, put an electrolytic with the same value back in place or something close to that value. Make sure the voltage is that value or higher and make sure the capacitance is that value or maybe slightly higher. You can go up a little bit without any worries in most cases. Anytime you need a coupling cap, anytime you see any old um, paper in wax caps, uh, wax, wax wrap paper caps or whatnot, just use some good yellow, yellow poly or orange drop caps and you'll be good. If you get into it and get stuck and uh, want to, you know, uh, want a little bit of help, I can try try to, but I just don't have the time to walk through schematics and build parts lists for people. It's kind of back to the previous question. Kind of wish I did, but I don't. All right, I'm sorry for all the negative answers here. I'm feeling like I'm on a little bit of a negative power trip, but it's not my intent. Just what I'm trying to do is head off some of the questions I get over and over. I'll probably get this question right here. Can you service my reel-to-reel -reel unit? Um, probably once a week or so. And um, let me give you the short and narrow of reel-to-reel -reel units. First off, if you've got a reel-to-reel -reel unit and it's old and hasn't been used in years, go search on eBay and see what one of them brings, one, uh, one that is in working condition. If it's not $200 or more, it may be questionable as to whether you want to sink the money into that thing or not. And the reason being is by the time you replace a belt in one of those, maybe a $20 belt, a lot of times the pinch rollers need to be um, replaced. And a lot, for a lot of units, those um, the um, pinch rollers are not available anymore. So you have to send them off to someone and they have to strip off your rubber and they have to custom build new pinch rollers for you. Those are typically about $75 a piece. Um, then you got to clean the unit, you got to align the heads, you got to, um, you know, uh, service and align whatever needs to be done. You got to clean all the potentiometers in the unit. At any rate, you end up typically in a real to real unit with about four hours worth of labor, typical. Um, it's just com they're complex units. They're not only electrical units, but they're mechanical units as well. So, you know, I, my rates were running at $45 an hour for those. You're at 160 bucks or so. You add into that another $100, $200 worth of parts. All of a sudden, you've got a bill up in the $250, $300 range. 
And then I would have customers say, wow, you put that quote together for me, but um, it, it costs more than what my unit's worth. The problem is I would spend 30 minutes putting a quote together for them that ultimately then they would say, no, I'm not going to do it. So I actually quit working on real to real units a while back myself. Uh, I just got out of that business uh, a couple years back. And um, But if you have a unit that's worth, I would say, $200 or more in working condition and you want to get it done, um, I know these guys here at Switched on Austin, um, John French, I've sent I've sent multiple customers to customers to him before, and I've used him myself. I've sent some high-end Atari equipment to him, and um, they do a great job. You know, they can do everything from getting heads rebuilt on high-end units. Um, I sent a friend to them recently, and they had a uh, high-end Atari um, eight-track, and um, they sent that thing. Um, you know, had the whole thing restored. You know, you can get into a lot of money, but you might be restoring a unit that you know new is ten or fifteen, twenty thousand uh, dollars for the recording studio stuff. But um, these guys can do it all. Um, just reach out to them if you need some real to real stuff done. Uh, but you know, I would I would heed my warning. If your unit's not worth two, three hundred dollars or more um, in used condition, it may or may not be worth um, getting serviced because uh, kind of pricey to do so. And for question eight, JBL L100 potentiometer cleaning. Somebody said, I just finished watching your YouTube on the JBL, JBL L100 binding post, woofer replacement, excellent information. He's got a set. He would like to uh, clean the potentiometers. Any recommendations before he takes out the woofer? Don't want to ruin that foil label around the um, brilliance and, and presence pops, pots. If I do need to take out the woofer, I might as well restore the caps as well in there. Any recommendations? Well, I got good news and I got bad. First off, um, two, if you look on the right, these are what the boards look like in a um, JBL L100. So you can get up in there if you're tricky. <laughs> and on the side of the pot over here where I'm pointing to right there and right here, you can get some deoxid in there and turn your uh, brilliance um, and presence knob and... Um, clean these things. It takes some maneuvering. You might have to uh, use a little red uh, nozzle on your deoxid thing and bend it around a little bit, but you can get up in there and clean these pots without that. But if you're wanting to replace these caps, probably not. Um, you're going to have to pull the, um, the boards out. And if you'll notice, there are four screws right here. And if you look at the front of your speaker, one screw is here, one screw is here, one screw is here. Sadly, the fourth one sits right underneath your foil label right here. So you're not getting these boards out without removing that foil. You can use a hair dryer and pull these off. Uh, when you pull them off, stick them on a piece of glass um, flat, then put another piece of glass on top of that. Um, and then continue to heat it a little bit and it'll uh, kind of flatten out a little bit and stay that way. And then when you get ready to put it back on, you have to epoxy the things back on. And usually they turn out pretty well or you can buy some replacement ones on eBay typically or online. You can search for them, uh, but they won't have the serial numbers on them. But I would tell you they will never look the same identical as when they go back on as they did before they were ever pulled off. May have a little wrinkle here or there, you can tell, but um, from two feet away they start to uh, they start to look fine. Just if you get up close on them you can probably tell. But So I hope that answers your question. Um, good. Yes, you can clean the pots. Bad. Replacing these caps, you're going to have to pull the ports. Hope that helped. Alright, here's a question um, right up my alley. Basically, tube blue glow cluster. Got a Fisher 500C. Basically, what they're saying is, I want to replace the power tubes, and I want some that glow blue, that have the nice blue ecstatic glowing. And which ones are those, and that, but yet still sound good? Well, that's a complicated question. Um, if you go on my site, www.blueglow.net, under Sketches and Info, there's a long post I made that answers your question about what may cause this blue glow in two tubes. There's a couple different reasons for it. Some are good and, and fine. Others are not. You're going to want to replace the tube if you're running into those. But as you can see here, it's a fluorescent glow. It's caused by uh, minor impurities such as cobalt, other things within the environment, um, within their inert gases, that slight traces that may still be in there. And what I've found is it's not consistent. I've bought like pairs of Gold Lion KT88s, put them in an amplifier, 
for some, you know, and they glowed blue. And then I had, you know, a friend over and saw them and said, whoa, I really like how those glow blue. I want to order a set of them. They would order a set, you know, maybe produced at a different time, different batch. They'd get them and they didn't glow quite as blue, you know, a little disappointing. But um, it's kind of hit or miss. And I wish I had a list because I would, I would put them in every single amplifier I have, but it's just not the case. So um, if anybody finds any differently, let me know. I would, I would love to have uh, and welcome some other opinions on this topic um, but that's a great article if you go read that out on my website I'll give you some good info on it all right as of late this has been one of my top few questions got to be in the top three as of late um, because I posted a lot of this I watched your Scott series and you used a tubing to protect the wire leads it's basically the little PTFE tubing can you point me in the right direction to order some well I've gotten this question three times in the last week uh, promise you uh, here's the thing this is where i get mine on ebay find the seller it's a top underscore authentic underscore auction they're not from the u.s no association to me it just where, uh, where i've been ordering them from then you can do a drop down and you can pick the color yellow clear blue red black whatnot and you can also then do the drop down here and you can pick the diameter you want and I use 0.7 millimeter, 0.9 millimeter, and 1.1 millimeter, all depending on how small or, you know, or thick the leads are on the components that I'm working with. And this stuff's dirt cheap. You can see here, you know, you're getting a one meter thing for three dollars and forty-nine cents. A meter is pretty pretty long, a little over three feet, and um, that's that'll last you a while. I usually order about, um, you know, eight or ten uh, meters at a time of, of different colors and, and use this. I like to use the clear personally, but I've got some of the other colors I've got some of the blue and whatnot but that's where you get it um, good luck and up next um, somebody has a TV7 tube testing question somebody said hey recently I got a TV7C and I'm trying to test some tubes here but they're not in the TV7 manual well, what can I do um, said the test book um, only gives minimum values but like to know what a new tube would be that's one question they had second question was they couldn't find a value for one of these and then third they said hey I was informed by tongue saw I can use the KT88 to test the KT120 and KT150 but like to know what minimum and new value should be well there's a little bit of uh, you're going to have to do a little bit of work on this first off you're going to want to jump over and uh, there is a GM conversion chart and here's a link to it or you can type in Google TV7 GM conversion chart hit enter and it will take you to this link and on that link it will say hey if your TV7 says 68 on the needle then it's this many micromos so it converts it over into GM values or you can uh, if you got a TV7 you can reach out to Daniel Nielsen and he will sell you a brand new meter to go into your unit that has the GM scale built onto it. Um, so you could read it right off the scale there without ever having to convert it on a chart. Once, you, and then there's also a another site here that has a calculator where you can type in like 6, 8 and it'll come back and tell you the, the GM value. Somebody built a little tool for it. Um, then pull out your handy dandy RCA tube manual and if you don't have an RCA receiving tube manual you should um, and go look up the GM specs it'll tell you in there what the new values are and what minimum values are and for the KT150 because those tubes are newer than the, la the last RCA tube manual was made was in made in like the uh, 76 or something like that I think um, the KT 150s 120s didn't exist then you'll need to go to new sensors website um, and pull the spec sheet on those and it should tell you the minimum GM values and the new GM values there and then um, the data for the 12FQ7, I found that. Here's how I did it. I went to Google and I typed in TV7 space 12FQ7 and I hit enter and bam, it took me to a site and gave me the uh, settings to put in on a TV7 to actually test one of those tubes. So not hard. Uh, Google is your friend and um, if, once you get things converted to GM value versus the uh, uh, kind of the, um, the 1 to 100 scale, which is... Uh, a little bit um oh, what's the word i'm looking for here um, um subjective or whatnot <laughs> um once you get on into gm then you can start using good documentation out there to tell you what your your values should be etc all right question 12 another negative nelly question 
I see you've stopped taking in new work. Can you recommend someone else to service my gear? Well, this is an interesting one. I actually got into servicing gear way back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s because <laughs> um, I had a lot of stuff and couldn't find anybody to work on my own stuff. So I said, well, I'll just go at it myself. That kind of took me into college to go get an electrical engineering degree. And from there, kind of got me into this hobby. So um, I understand your uh, your pain. Um, sadly, I don't know of anyone right now. Honestly, there are some good people out there. Don't get me wrong. Um, just, you know, do some good searching. Do some background checks on them. Do some um, post on various forums asking about them, etc. Um, if you do find someone and want to email me and ask them if I know them, it may spark a memory I have, and I could tell you that. I do know of two guys in Tennessee that I would trust with my life, but both are pretty backed up. Matter of fact, I saw on one of them's website that they're not taking in new work right now, similar to me, for summer break, etc., trying to get caught up, and uh, and that's Terry DeWick. Um, he's in Tennessee. Uh, he's kind of a Macintosh guru, but he does work on other stuff. And there's another guy I know there in Chattanooga, Charlie Harris. Mostly does guitar amps, but he also gets into hi-fi. And I reached out to him, and he said, same story. Hey, you can send them my way, but I'm way backed up. So uh, if they're looking for something in the near future or something fast, I'm probably not the right guy for you. So um, like I say, hit go back to those sites I posted earlier. Uh, let me see if I can find them again here. Um, way back up here right there and um, you know post on there and and people run ads on these sites as well uh, maybe help you out a little bit good luck though and i uh, be glad to uh, give you my opinion like I said if you do find someone you want to send something to all right here I go back up on my soapbox <laughs> here's the question can I call you well most people don't ever ask that question they just call me and here, here's my response um, I'd much rather prefer to get an email then receive a phone call the beauty of an email is I can then respond to it when I have time keep in mind I've got a busy day job I've got three teenagers a wife and uh, a, a busy life outside of this hobby this is not a full-time business for me um, so you know I put here people call me while I'm at my day job and in meetings <laughs> People call me when I'm out at dinner with my family. People, I've had people call as late as 11 and 12 o'clock here. They're out in on the East Coast or in Canada or somewhere, and they don't even realize what time it is. It's 8 o'clock their time, and they don't realize it's 11 o'clock my time. Um, so here's what I'd like to ask. I'd be glad to talk to you on the phone. I have no problem with that. But email me first. And if I can't answer your question via email, then we can set up a time that works for both of us. You know, we might have to swap a couple emails back and forth. Um, but just calling me cold, it's going gonna, it's gonna to end up in my voicemail nine times out of ten. And honestly, half the time I don't, I don't ever get back to listen to voicemails. I, I, I hate voicemails. I actually, for the last ten years at work, have turned off my voicemail and uh, basically have a voicemail that says, uh, meet, a greeting that says, I do not accept voicemails. Please, uh, please uh, shoot me an email uh, <laughs> at my day job. I don't know if my new company will let me do that or not, but I've gotten by with it for a while. Like I say, not trying to be difficult, but I average about 20 calls a week on average, people calling me, asking questions. That's a lot for just a hobby. It's not It's not my job, you know. Um, so it's just it's a lot to defend off. So uh, email me first. We'll set up a time. I'll, I'll do my best to help anybody. That's why I'm doing this stuff, to try to help others. The other beauty of an email, hey, I can turn it into a uh, question on my question and answer series like this and not only help you, but help others out as well. Thanks. Up next, someone's saying they've got a Marantz 2275. The problem they're having is it's got cross-talking between sources. Um, there's an auxiliary sound coming through the phono stage, and the same with the FM. It's faint. You know, what can I do about this? Well, I'm just going to give you a tip. Start by rebuilding the phono and preamp boards to start with. 90% of the time, this will solve your issues. Because typically when you get in crosstalk, it's early, early on in the amplifier stages, and it's coming from leaky capacitors somewhere in there, allowing uh, the... Um, the signal to get over into another part of a circuit so just a good starting point if that doesn't solve it um, shoot me an email and we can kind of keep troubleshooting from there maybe via email 
Okay, I got somebody asking here. I've got some. I'd like to get into the audio equipment gear, you know, test gear, but the HP and Hickox you used are more expensive than I'd like to spend. Or there's some more entry level units you can suggest. And basically, what I'm saying is the HP 8093 is a good cheap route for an analyzer. You can get one for about four or five hundred bucks. But if that's not cheap enough, go check out the Analog Discovery 2. It's basically a uh, you can get them from Mauser and other places. Um, it's basically a software driven. Um, analyzer um, but there's some software that you can add to it that makes it into a pretty darn decent um, audio analyzer so um, check that out it, it'll you know it lets you do things like frequency response sweeps etc so uh, it does get a pretty technical um, and complex to use so you, you know may have to do a little bit of studying if you're going to go this route um, you know, uh, tube testers, find you a nice ICO 667. I picked one up at a ham fest this past weekend. Um, it does mutual conductance, easy to use. This thing will do compactrons. The only thing it will not do is the older type 4-pin um, direct heated uh, triodes, etc. cetera, uh, 300B, 45, 2A3s, et cetera. Um, however, there is a model called the 666 that will do those but it does not do the compactron so uh, if i was going to pick one i'd go this route you can get one for about 200 bucks great little tube tester it does do mutual uh, conductance and there are spreadsheets available online with many more tube types that come then come in the little booklet that typically came with that thing so great little route uh, for what you need and like i say this analog discovery too I think it can also do some spectrum analyzer type stuff. So uh, not a bad route if you can get into that for $279 and maybe do a, what I'm doing with both the uh, the audio analyzer and the uh, spectrum analyzer there in one unit. And up next, hey, this wasn't really a uh, question, but this was something that someone sent me. They said, look at this. This may be what you need. They had seen in one of my videos when I rebuilt that Marantz rack mount setup that I have that the uh, the scope in it um, on the tuner, I was missing a knob. And they actually saw out here where there was a, uh, a vertical scope horizontal control knob for a Marantz 20. And I ordered that thing. Uh, it was 15 bucks with $6 shipping. It showed up two days later, and I've got it sit here in front of me right now. So I just wanted to say thank you to Larry for uh, putting, giving me that tip. I was glad to find it and uh, may have never found another one because those things are extremely rare. I almost started to order the other one just to have it as a spare, but then I thought, gosh, somebody else out there may be looking for one just like me, and I didn't want to hoard it up. So uh, there again, thanks, Larry. Appreciate it. And I just got this one in the last day or so. Hope um, question. Hope this this was a reply to the Audio Tube Amp 101 series. Hope this series picks it up again. It's helped me immensely. Thanks for doing it. And the answer to my question to that question is yes. Hopefully this winter when it's too cold and I'm snowed in or whatever and I'm just stuck in the house for long weekends and it's uh, dark outside. You know when I leave for work and dark outside when I get home from work. Uh, not much else to do. I hope to get back to this series, or that's my intent anyway. I enjoyed making it, and I've got a lot more to do, so um, I, I do plan on continuing that. Just stay tuned. Okay, just got this question in the last week. I saw your YouTube video on the Pioneer um, SX850. Had his a long time. Uh, turned it on last week. Have FM, no FM sound, but can listen to AM stations. Any ideas what wrong? What's wrong? And my initial email back to the individual was, hey, could be a lot of things there. It could be a bad cap. Um, you know, just a lot of things could cause um, you know, the FM section to go out. It, it's it's not like I can point you to one com you know, single part and say, go replace that and it'll fix it. However, um, Steve emailed me back and said, oh, that's okay. I figured out what was wrong with it anyway. I took the cover off and laying inside was a dime. Um, and so I'm assuming the dime was shorting something out, causing his FM not to work. But hey, you gotta be you gotta watch out sometimes. I've found a lot of things inside amplifiers over time that fallen down through the little cracks in the top. So, you know, um, pick a unit up, shake it, see if anything's loose on the inside. Maybe something run, rolling around in there causing your issue. It's not a bad place to start. Okay, I actually had a 19th question, and it was going to be my tech tip, but I notice I'm already up around 45 minutes on this video, and I thought it was getting a little long, So, and the tech tip itself is probably going to be about 10 or 15 minutes. It's actually on how to bias a Dynaco ST70, 
which by the way isn't much different than how you bias any tube amplifier output section. So I thought that was worthy of its own little video. I'm going to break it out, do it one night this week if I can find time and get it posted. Um, you know that that'll that'll make up for the uh, the tech tip, or you can kind of consider the uh, schematic walkthrough and where to place the uh, the newer coupling caps on this one. Your tech tip, and uh, at any rate, thanks everybody. Thank you for your support. Uh, I get I get a multitude of emails and thank yous for the stuff I'm doing. Spent some time talking to some guys this weekend that had seen my videos, and they were. They were giving me uh, kudos and accolades, and uh, you know, hey, I'm not perfect. I don't get all this stuff right, but um, you know, I'm out here on YouTube uh, doing doing what I can, trying to help the community. So, thanks everybody. We'll keep these things rolling uh, regardless of the uh, shutting down the business. I've got enough gear of my own to keep making videos for years, so uh, we'll keep doing it. Thanks for watching, everybody. Stay tuned. I got more coming soon.